Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by viewers like you. This week on New Mexico in Focus, wildfire state of emergency, the federal help our governor is requesting, and what else can be done to control the crisis? Plus, and we understand that boarding school policies were, um, along with other aggressive assimilationist policies, were a part of the formation of the settler states. Where does New Mexico fit after the Pope's apology to Canada for past atrocities at native boarding schools? New Mexico in Focus starts now. Thanks for joining us this week. I'm your host, Gene Grant. We're barely over a month away from the primary elections and new developments are impacting key contests in about 25 minutes. We'll talk about the Attorney General's race where campaign donations are under the microscope. Outdated and deficient, those are just two of the words used to describe the federal oil and gas program in a review from the Interior Department. At the bottom of the show, we'll talk about what changes should be made to prioritize tribal needs and to adequately compensate taxpayers. We'll also hear from New Mexico's Natural Resources Trustee, Maggie Hart Stebbins. In about half an hour, environment reporter Laura Paskus asks her about the recent $1.5 million settlement to restore environmental damage at Fort Wingate, the former Army installation near Gallup. But we begin with the ongoing and shockingly early start to the fire season. Crews have already been called to dozens of fires with more than a half dozen growing out of control. The governor has called for a state of emergency, but what else can be done? Let's get to the line. Hello, welcome to our line panelists this week. Welcome back to, form, welcome back to former state Senator Dee Dee Feldman and Diane Snyder both. And it's great to see attorney Ed Perea back with us as well. We're gonna start with what's been the most pressing issue the last few weeks, wildfires burning across the state. We gave you some context and perspective on why this fire season started so early during the longest season an Our Land Wildfire Special, which aired last week. Now, scientists have explained that increased drought is only making these fires worse. Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham has already issued an emergency order saying 93% of the state is currently dealing with severe drought conditions. The governor and state forest officials are asking for more resources and more fire crews. Ed, let me start with you. Is this the right move at the right time? Absolutely. All the, all the, uh additional resources that we can get to deal with these problems mm -hmm. and, and unprecedented problems. We have always had fires, wildfires for a whole variety of reasons in this state, but I think we are looking at unprecedented uh, times. We have fires in the north, we have fires in the south, mm -hmm. uh, and it's creating a lot of damage to the structures out there. Uh, there apparently are, are issues with the number of, of firefighters who are available to fight these right. fires. So that's yeah. another uh, you know, manpower issue that we're, we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And the longer we, it takes to control any of these fires, the more destruction, environmental destruction, and destruction to private property it's going it, it'll, to it'll cause. And so, uh, yeah, this is definitely the right, the right move. I think uh, if it's the first, second, third step, that's good. But we need a lot more efforts in which to bring people in, bring resources in, whether it's federal, whether it's sharing with other states, mm -hmm. in order to get these fires under control. We are very early in the season, and so there's a lot more to go. So the more we do now, the better off we're going to be down the road. Good point. Senator Snyder, you know, the governor requested 25 additional support officers to help coordinate emergency response. That's a good start for sure. Is there something else in your mind's eye or in your view uh, the governor could be doing at this point? I, well, I think she's doing what she's legally allowed to do. Okay. The legislature, and I'm going to defer to Senator Bellman on all the details because mm -hmm. she was very active with several governors about getting uh, some control over, or, over uh, fireworks. But I did a little research. I wanted to check and see where New Mexico fit in mm -hmm. nationally. And there's a wonderful re, uh, studies, but this was from 2021. And the top five states do not include us. It's California, Oregon, Washington, Montana, and Texas. Mm -hmm. New Mexico is 11 at having the most wildfires. But the thing that absolutely struck me the most is that the, through their studies and collection of data, 85% of the fires are started by human beings oh. or can be tied to an action of some, whether it's a campfire or a, or a cigarette tossed. Not, it, that's not all arson, it's unintentional. Mm -hmm. uh, fires started by mm -hmm. human beings, you know, and that scares me to death. Mm -hmm. I, I think about it and I go, 
how do we get people to be, I mean, we see some, even Smokey the Bear, all of the, Smokey right. Bear, pardon me, not the, no, the, the Smokey <laughs> Bear, uh, is how much more education can we do to get people to understand that they are responsible. They have an obligation when they go into our state forest or our national forest, they're talking and playing with everybody's future. Mm -hmm. And particularly when you're talking about the devastation of homes and livestock and families. We've been very fortunate this year. We've only lost two dear, wonderful older people, but that's just lucky that we haven't lost more Agreed. by all of the fires going on. So I, I guess what I, the point I'm trying to make is, and I don't know how to do it, is we've got to get people to step up, do the education, and make them understand that 85% of our fires are related to a human being's actions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how we do it, but we've got to focus on that in some way. Let me ask Senator Feldman about how we do it. Is it time for, or maybe we should have had it on the air already, a major awareness campaign? I realize April kind of took everybody a little bit off guard, but and we can be forget they can be forgiven for that. But should at this point, perhaps a big TV campaign around the state, newspapers, everything, would that be money well spent? Yes, we should. Yeah. We should be doing that. Definitely. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, the Forest Service already does that. As Diane said, Smokey Bear is mm -hmm. out there, but not yeah. enough. Um, and the state forester uh, has the and, and keep in mind that there are bans uh, on fireworks, cigarettes, campfires in uh, for on Forest Service lands. Um, and the state forester can um, also ban those activities on any uh, non-municipal uh, land uh, and on state lands. Uh, so there are, are, there are uh, requirements, but they are uh, honored in the breach uh, mm -hmm. rather than, uh, rather than uh, in, and, and are largely unenforced. I mean, it's one thing to uh, have a public relations campaign, but it's another thing to enforce those regulations. Right. And the Forest Service do just doesn't have the personnel to do that. Mm -hmm. They're lucky to be able to feel, feel the firefighters uh, to fight the fires, mm -hmm. which are also, just to Ed's point, quite costly, uh, quite, quite costly. Millions of dollars are spent for every one of these fires in fire suppression alone right. and that doesn't even count the other expenses of you know emergency relief um insurance protection uh, all those all those other things that happen uh during a fire and in its aftermath mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. ed you know i want you to pick up on that it, it seems to me and this has been discussed before this is not my my idea why does the federal government leave this up to states to fight their own, you know, fires? Why don't we have a federal, I don't know, not a task force, but a federal something that they come in and actually do this? We pay them ta good tax money <laughs> to do these kinds of things. And they, why don't they have all the planes, have all the fire suppression stuff at their disposal, ready to come in instead of leaving it for the governors to, to figure this out? And you're right, Gene, the, the federal government puts it on the states. I mean, there is some federal support and, and, and from time to time. But why can't uh, they take the lead? I mean, you know what I mean? Why, why, are, they, why are they in a support position? Yeah, and, 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 that, and that, that's right, Gene. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's, I, I guess in many cases, you know, there's there's the argument. What is the federal government's responsibility? What is the state's? And mm -hmm. I think somewhere down the line, a decision was was made. And, and maybe the maybe the states have wanted a little more control over how they deal with their fire situation. You know, because if you if you give turn over more control on this issue to the federal government, then when it comes to burns and, and other things of managing the forest lands, uh, that way may, may remove some of the control from the state. So mm -hmm. there may have been some issues in the back that just the federal government has taken a step back and, and allowed the states to do it. But this but the federal government is a resources. They do have the resources. And yeah, I would like to see a little more federal government involvement. Mm -hmm. I, I know they have become involved. I don't know why they have not become more involved. I mean, but but they oh. do uh, and they should be involved. 
Right. Senator Feldman, pick up on that if you would. I, I really think they are taking the lead. Okay. And they, they are, um, you know, this is beyond one state's capability. Right. And that is why you see hotshot crews directed into those fire areas mm -hmm. from other states. Mm -hmm. And uh, those, uh, and that's the U.S. Forest Service. Mm -hmm. And that is the federal government. And they set up incident command centers. Uh, there was one set up recently in, in Hamas uh, for information on the Cerro Palado fire. Mm -hmm. um, and they came and they, they give the local residents information about where the fire is, where it spreads, where the evacuations orders are. And so we have, you know, over a, a thousand firefighters uh, now in the state of New Mexico, and uh, many of them are from out of state. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's due to the agreements that the Forest Service has mm -hmm. um, in, in its wildland firefighting um, uh, uh, task forces and crews. Mm -hmm. But you know, you know, I, I'm curious, Senator uh, Snyder, let me ask you this as well. I really don't hear a lot of senators, I don't want to you know, put our senators under the bus here, but when fire season ends, it always seems like the discussion ends with it. And you never yes. really hear like, well, you know what, this is getting worse, here's our plan for next year, here's our plan for the year after that. And I say particularly about the issue Ed brought up earlier, which is uh, manpower and these folks being paid $15 an hour to risk their lives going from fire to fire to fire. I just, where's the push in Congress to get better pay, recruit more firefighters, all that kind of stuff. Am I off here? I just never hear that during the off fire season. No, I think, we, I think we're mm -hmm. very human in the sense that we go, oh, it's gone. Now we can breathe for a few months, but that's not what's really happening. Mm -hmm. We're not, in my opinion, we're not preparing enough in advance. Uh, what the report I talked about earlier, the mm -hmm. least fires, which is interesting to me, are Delaware, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, Vermont, and Connecticut. All, and they all have forest. They all have more water, obviously, and moisture than we right. do. Right. <laughs> but somewhere in the middle, there must be some states we could learn some best practices from. Mm -hmm. What what can we what can New Mexico do? And I look at all this money that we have right now, and if there was ever going to be a time to invest in mm -hmm. the staff, the equipment, the and I know from when I was in the Senate how hard I fought to get equipment, additional equipment for our public safety people is uh Forest people come out way below them right. in, in the right. priorities. And I'm just going, you got a chance here. Do something. This is the time to take that money and invest it in what we need to do to keep our people safe. Good points there. Uh, go go ahead, real quick. Mm -hmm. This is a really a political issue, and there's this tug of war as to who takes the lead, the state or the federal government. Yep. The previous federal administrations has thrown it on. There was some criticism with how the the fires were being dealt with in in california mm -hmm. and the the federal government's position at that time was that's your problem you deal with it uh and they sort of put it on the states so it is a it's a political hot potato pardon the pun uh so to speak when it comes to who ultimately takes control but there is some shared responsibility mm -hmm. maybe there needs to be a discussion about more of it and how to be more efficient absolutely Hey, thank you all for that discussion. This is obviously a very complex issue, with, complex issue without a lot of clear solutions. We're going to keep trying to make sense of it for you through the weeks and months to come. We'll check back in with our line panelists in about 10 minutes to talk about some of the recent political developments ahead of the June primary. Fort Wingate was used for decades to store munitions and destroy obsolete munitions. And so um, there were releases of contamination into the water, into the soil, um, and destruction of, um, of habitat. Pope Francis has apologized to Canada's indigenous people for the Catholic Church's role in Indian boarding schools where thousands of students were abused and thousands died. The Pope made the apology and asked for forgiveness after meetings with an, an indigenous delegation that traveled to the Vatican from Canada. Residential schools were run by churches and funded by the Canadian government 
from the late 1800s, with the last one closing in 1996. The United States has a similar history with boarding schools, including right here in Albuquerque and Santa Fe. So this week, correspondent Antonia Gonzalez speaks with members of the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition about what the apology means in context. Samuel and Joni, welcome to New Mexico in Focus. Thank you so much for having us. Joni, start us off and just tell us, what was your reaction when you heard that Pope Francis had apologized to Canada's indigenous people for the Catholic Church's role in the Indian residential schools? Thank you for your question, Antonia. You know, for me personally, it brought up a lot of unresolved um, trauma, thinking about all of the research that I've conducted as a student currently at the University of Washington Tacoma pursuing a doctorate in educational leadership and also my work for the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition based out of uh, Minnesota and also in deep reflection of my Pueblo Irish um, roots here in New Mexico and understanding the deeply entwined um, and very nuanced ways in which Catholicism has woven itself into our Pueblo culture. I also reflected on the ways in which our survivors and their families, as well as those who did not return home, may have um, had mixed feelings on the apology, whether it was accepted wholeheartedly or that it's a good start but personally I feel that um, going back to my own Pueblo and core values forgiveness is one of the um, important pieces that we practice on a daily basis and um, for me I feel like it's a really good opportunity to begin having these conversations. And Samuel your thoughts what did you think when you heard Pope Francis apologize to Canada's indigenous people? Uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you for having uh, our voice on, on this segment right now, and I really appreciate the words shared by Joni. Um, it, it's, a, it's a complicated and nuanced setting, of course, as Joni mentions, um, very much looking at it as uh, an important dialogue starter. And uh, I think, number one, most importantly, the recognition of the harms done. I think is uh, always a good place to start. But as we know and what we have seen um, with uh, apologies and land acknowledgments made in the past, we must know that actions and uh, an intention to address the social conditions that could create a systemic uh, environment of oppression uh, such as the federal Indian boarding school policies uh, of the United States of Canada and um, on behalf of the Catholic Church, uh, issuing an apology, uh, of course, I think is important, and and it, and it can't be, um, it can't be understated that uh, for for many survivors, descendants, families, relatives that have been deeply impacted by this, I know that there are a lot of folks that have been waiting a long time to hear words such as these, and so there is some healing power in that, um, in that the ability to transform um, those deep wounds into a place of, of hope, of growth, of, of healing. That said, we know that there's also a lot that the Catholic Church and, and other Christian denominations and settler nation governments can do to be able to uh, back up those words of apology. And um, the work of the, of the Healing Coalition uh, has for years been been very adamant about uh, these Christian denominations as well as the federal government to increase the access of boarding school records and documents. Those documents that have been shown to generate uh, such healing power for relatives that are looking to find out more about their, their ancestors, um, their relatives that in some cases are still living uh, those documents often are uh, so powerful for families, for nations to be able to more deeply understand uh, the, 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 the scope of, of, of damage, the scope of the impacts uh, which are still ongoing. And Joni, the apology from Pope Francis was to Indigenous people in Canada. 
What do you think people here in the United States when it comes to Native Americans, Alaska Natives who went through boarding school um, systems here, which a lot of our stories mirror what was going on in Canada. What do you think that Native people here want to see from the Catholic Church? Thank you. I um, can agree more with my brother Sam and I definitely feel that this is a great step. There's so much momentum happening right now and um, much like our Métis, our Inuit and First Nations relatives in Canada, we want an acknowledgement as well here in the United States and it's important to also um, understand that each community and their respective experiences are going to be very different in terms of what they define as reparations, what that could look like. But in terms of a call to action for right now and taking those measurable steps, I think that the next um, opportunity would be for the Pope to come to the United States as well, to step foot on our soil here on Turtle Island and to begin having those conversations with our communities. And anything to add to that, Samuel, about not only just um, here, you know, the lower 48 tribes, but also people in Alaska as well that um, you work with have some similar boarding school stories. It is an inescapable uh, entanglement that, that is clearly there. And, and one of the things that I think is, is really helpful to try to understand where and how this apology has come to be, um, it, it didn't come out of nowhere. And we understand that with the, fi the findings of First Nations peoples, um, with the, the ground penetrating radar and magnetometry cemetery survey results of, of the past year, um, they don't, they, they have not been had under um, just a, in a vacuum. They have not emerged as a, a random set of occurrences and folks that are not as um, aware of, of this ongoing work that has been happening um, on Turtle Island for, you know, many decades, many generations of truth seeking, of truth telling. Um, had a, a very consequential moment in uh, with the Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, in in the early 2000s and uh, so Canada is in some in some ways shape or form uh, a bit further ahead than the United States as it relates to the work in the coalition we um, helped to write uh, both HR 5444 and Senate Bill 2907, the Truth and Healing Commission Bill on Indian Boarding Schools Policy Act. Um, and we are generating a lot of interest, a lot of uh, doing a lot of education work and advocacy around the bill. But this is work that needs to be codified into law and needs to be uh, included within the political discourse of the United States. There is a national investigation here in the United States led by Secretary of the Interior Deb Holland and the coalition is taking part in that. Why is it important to uncover these documents, to have people share their stories, and it is traumatizing. Every single person in Indian country has been impacted gener generations by Indian boarding schools. So we're not talking about a history that's a long time ago. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's still impacting our tribal communities and it's, it's hard to talk about. So Joni, why is it so important for this investigation to uncover um, documents, but also just share with the public? It's so important and critical right now because we don't know, as of today still, how many children went missing while at federal Indian run boarding schools. And I think that there's so much momentum happening right now with um, our Pueblo sister, Secretary Holland, to be able to make um, some really great strides in this area and to call to action um, the opportunity to have access to these records, to church records, to records at the National Archive and um, other locations, and also to really understand the intergenerational impacts of trauma that it's had on communities. And we've seen these ripple effects carried out through the timeline of federal Indian law and policy and looking at education being one of those long-standing pieces in which uh, children and families um, and the push for English only literacy, the push for um, 
the, the, the Catholic denomination uh, within um, communities here in New Mexico to be the way forward. And now we're in a race with time to save our cultures and languages, to heal our trauma, to raise our families. And um, you know, I, I feel that this is also generational work. It's um, the prayers of our ancestors who are not very far removed. Um, six or seven generations back who attended places like Carlisle Indian Industrial School and who did not make it home. And those who experienced trauma while at school and or the loss of their peers and then returning to their communities and trying to reintegrate themselves into um, Pueblo culture or indigenous culture in general, we see those effects today in um, particularly uh, families and at the communal level when we think about nation building, when we think about the opportunities that we have to um, continue the conversation around how we reclaim our children through education and language. Well, thank you for that, Samuel and Joni. Thank you both for joining us today and sharing a little bit about your thoughts on the Pope's apology and the work of the coalition. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us, Nitra. Yes, thank you for having us on the show. Welcome back to the Line Opinion panelists. Looking ahead to the June primary, the race for the Republican nomination for governor is taking a lot of the headlines right now, but a recent campaign finance report is raising questions in the Democratic race for attorney general as well. State Auditor Brian Colon has received more than $150,000 from out-of-state law firms supporting his campaign. There's speculation these donations could lead to state contracts on big cases if Mr. Colon were to be elected. Now, Senator Snyder, let me talk, start with you on this. Should this be concerning to voters? Is this a little bit of an inside political baseball? Or how big is this in your view? I think for most voters, they weren't even aware that right. that, that was going on. I think that most people's immediate reaction is what? Mm -hmm. You're taking campaign contributions from the people that you're then awarding contracts to. Uh, but in reading about this, I guess we've been doing it for quite some time. And um, I, I don't know that, certainly don't advocate that just because we've been doing it, it makes it legitimate. Mm -hmm. But I looked up, I did a little research and the Centers for Public Integrity had a list. Uh, unfortunately, the report was from 2016. So I don't know if New Mexico has changed any laws or not. Maybe y'all can help me with that. But there were only uh, 15 states that had any restrictions like that on attorney general race, any kind of restrictions of any kind on attorney general races. New Mexico was one of them. But when you re read on into it, you found that it's perfectly acceptable for them to accept contributions while they're running, before, it, when they're elected, the only, and then after a contract has been awarded, the only restriction is they may not accept contributions during the negotiation of a contract. Hmm. Well, if you've already, if you've already been given the money up front, right. that, that little caveat is, is worth nothing in my opinion. And I, there's a part of me that goes, I understand when, when they say they're trying to save money by combining with other states and doing, and you end up with a, I, I know, I believe it was uh, New York City, Washington, DC, where it seemed to be the basis for most of the out of state big law firms that New Mexico has contracted with. Have you noticed that? Uh, That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. It really is these big uh, New York and DC firms. Oh, like, okay. And I thought it was interesting right. that candidate, Mr. Colleen, has accepted a number of contributions from people with contracts currently or in the past. And uh, Mr. Bruce has not, but he's accepted it from local firms. Right. Well, I'm not sure what that says either. Just, but let me, let me, let me ask uh, Senator Feldman that very question. Yeah. I appreciate that point that um, Mr. Torres, the other Democratic candidate in that AG's race has not taken any major donations from out of state. But 32,000 from in-state. Do you cut a difference there between in-state and out-of-state for these kind of donations? Not really. Yeah. Not really, I don't think. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is part of a bigger problem, the problem of a conflict of interest and the problem of quid pro quo, uh, mm -hmm. making a contribution and then getting a contract. 
we do have well, only we have very few laws that cover this mm -hmm. and because it looks almost like legalized bribery you know right uh and uh we do have one law uh, that i was involved with and that is at least the at least the people that are bidding on the contracts have to disclose that they've made a campaign contribution mm -hmm. to the attorney general that's you know, I thought that was the least they could do. Sure. Um, <laughs> kind of but, there. you know, but but Diane's right. I mean, this is a time honored practice that goes back to to Patricia Madrid, to Udall, to mm -hmm. uh, everyone. And the and what the attorney general say is that unless they have the top notch lawyers, uh, the trial lawyers from out of state who are uh, who are expert at taking on big pharma, taking on the tobacco That's industry. Right. Uh, we're not, we, we're little New Mexico. We're not going to, we're not going to get very far when it comes to protecting consumers. And so um, this has been the, the reason in the past. Um, and it's, it's somewhat valid. I think the whole thing would be, um, would be settled if, if attorney generals like our judges were able to participate in a public financing ah. uh, program mm -hmm. where Maybe. they didn't have to worry about being beholden to their contributors. Yes. Um, so, you know, that's that's another solution. That's interesting. Ed, let me read you a quote here from fellow you guys know, Damon Ely, um, Democratic State Senator, Senator from, uh, State Representative, excuse me, from Corrales. His problem with this is, a uh, quote, he said the extensive use of outside lawyers has eroded legal expertise within the AG's office. And the second point I wanted you, to, to, you guys to touch, he says outside firms have an incentive to settle a case quickly in order to get paid quickly. I, <laughs> there's something about that just seems like such a dead end, Ed. I, I just, I don't get it. Let's talk about the idea of the, of the it erodes expertise in the AG's office. Do you agree with that? I mean, clearly, I think that's one of the reasons that was stated for going externally is right. because that's we right. lack the expertise here. So it's, you know, you get, you know, you, you lose your, your expertise by not giving locals the opportunity to acquire that expertise. Yep. And so, um, so yeah, I mean, that's... And, that's, and, that's, to that's, interrupt, that's, and to make the big dough. Do you know what I mean? Because <laughs> it's all going to Dallas and Chicago and New York at this point. So, you know. And Gene, that goes to your second point. What yeah. are the motivations here, right? I mean, if, if you're local, you may have more local motivations in the interest of your of your community. But if you're a New York firm or a L.A. firm, well, it's about the bottom line. It's how do you make the, right. the, the quickest buck for your firm? Mm -hmm. And in all cases, most cases go to some sort of settlement phase. And, and a lot of times that's the quickest way to get in, get out for, for, your, for the maximum uh, benefit. And so, yeah, I, I think those are, 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 are two valid uh, concerns mm -hmm. that were made. But Gene, this is a sign of the times. This is, this is the way politics are done That's these right. days. Under uh, Citizens United, the United States Supreme Court decision of 2010, it really opened up the avenues of contributions, especially with multinational uh, corporations. I mean, we are seeing more and more of that, yeah. but it's not a local yes. problem, it's a national problem because it's allowed. And so the question really is, do we want to play by the rules and, and, and use the rules to our advantage, or do we look at this from another another angle? And right now, all appearances are that uh, that, that the current uh, state auditor, Mr. Mm -hmm. Colon, is playing by the rules. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the other side is saying, well, you know, maybe or maybe not. I'm not sure what their what their reasoning for not getting out of state contributions are. But uh, in, in full disclosure here, I was a candidate for the DA's office in 2016. Mm -hmm. I, my campaign was outspent eight to one by hmm. by my opponent, Mr. Torres, and he received huge funding from from Mr. Soros. And so, if you're local, if you're the local candidate, and you and you're not getting those external right. uh, contributions, right. you yeah. you're probably saying, "Hey, wait, 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 you know, where's the fairness in this?" However, if you are getting those those contributions that are they're legal under Citizens United, you're saying, "Hey." I'm playing by the rules. So sometimes it's, it's a, a decision that, that you have to make. That's right. But the Supreme Court has allowed this to happen and until there's a decision to the contrary. Mm -hmm. This is the way the political game is being played. Mm -hmm. Senator Snyder, I you have a point? Yeah. Yes, actually, it's a concern is I was reading and in the one of the most recent, the settlement uh, with the solar company is ah. 
in the news, we hear, oh, so-and-so AG and the state of New Mexico won this lawsuit and this amount of money has been given to New Mexico. Well, where does that money go when it gets here? Mm -hmm. And as, as I understand what I've been reading is not a single New Mexican who was involved in the case got any of the money that came in. That's right. It was it came in, went out to the big company law firms, it went into the state, but the and that they our AG signed a non disclosure agreement that would not tell people what happened and why it happened. Mm -hmm. But they can research, they cannot find a single New Mexican who was involved in the lawsuit getting compensation from the settlement. We're a little short on time. We're going to have to end it there, but that's interesting. And I think that makes the point that Senator Feldman made just a bit ago, perhaps with some reform about how this money is doled out. They don't, we don't have to have our AG folks with hat in hand across state borders. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Thank you once again to our panel. We'll be back in just over 10 minutes to talk about oil and gas leasing opening back up on public lands. Up first, the latest on a settlement regarding pollution at the Fort Wingate Depot. New Mexico Natural Resources Trustee Maggie Hart Stebbins discusses the settlement with environment correspondent Laura Pascas, as well as another potential payout over the Gold King mine spill. Maggie Hart Stebbins, welcome to New Mexico in Focus. Oh, it is great to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. <laughs> um, so let's start with your office. What's the mission of the New Mexico Natural Resources Trustee? So in 2019, Governor Lujan Grisham appointed me to be New Mexico's Natural Resources Trustee. And what our office does is we, um, we sue polluters. So when there is a release of some kind of hazardous um, substance into New Mexico's environment, there, um, the environment department plays the role of making sure that gets cleaned up to a health-based standard. Then the Office of the Natural Resources Trustee um, reaches out to the party that's responsible for that release of contamination. And we ask for compensation for the community for the injury that has taken place to natural resources. So natural resources, um, groundwater, surface water, drinking water, um, wildlife habitat, um, biota, which is, you know, any part of the natural, um, you know, the biological community that exists in a place. And so, you know, we are, we are very complimentary and we partner with the Environment Department, but our role really is to make sure that New Mexicans are compensated when they have suffered a loss of, uh, loss of access uh, to their natural resources. So last month, your office announced a settlement involving Fort Wingate. Correct. Um, with the U.S. government on behalf of the U.S. Army. And for people who might not be familiar, um, with Fort Wingate, it's a 15,000 acre depot that um, the Army started using in the 19th century, mm -hmm. used through the 90s. Um, and I guess they're still used for missile launching activities. Right. Um, so what is the settlement that your office was working through with the U.S. government and the Zuni tribe and the Navajo Nation? Fort Wingate was used for decades to store munitions and destroy obsolete munitions. And so um, there were releases of contamination into the water, into the soil, um, and destruction of, um, of habitat. And so in 2008, actually, my predecessor, um, uh, Jim Baca, when he was Natural Resources Trustee, he began the process of bringing a natural resources damage claim against the Army. So this started in 2008, um, and there was quite a bit of work done to evaluate, in, in partnership with the Army, actually, it was a cooperative assessment um, uh, to evaluate what was, what's the extent of the damage, and then work done to figure out what, what needs to be done to bring these natural resources back to the original condition. And that's our mission at ONRT, is to bring natural resources to the, back to the condition they were in before contamination. So this work between 2008 and 2012, there was a lot of work done, again, Zuni, um, Zuni tribe, Navajo Nation, um, the BIA was, you know, was engaged in that, the Fish and Wildlife Service, the Forest Service, you know, in this conversation about what has to happen to, you know, compensate the community, bring the resources back to their original condition. Um, in 2012, there was a consent decree that was uh, agreed upon in principle. And so um, for the last many years, we have been working to um, 
to get all the, the signatures, uh, get that finalized, and that was filed in federal court um, just a couple weeks ago. So there's a 30-day co uh, public comment period, so anyone who's interested can go to our website, um, click on the Fort Wingate links, and see what that consent decree is. It involves um, a payment of about um, $1.4 million that will be used um, to compensate past costs um, and pay for um, future restoration projects. So when I've, when I've looked through the environmental cleanup documents, there's like things like explosives, perchlorates, nitrates, PCBs, um, pesticides, like all kinds of contamination out there. How much of that has been cleaned up already and how much is still like a work in progress? I don't know the exact numbers on that. The Environment Department, the New Mexico Environment Department, their, their Hazardous Waste Bureau is responsible for that element of it. Our piece is kind of separate and independent of that. So that $1.4 million that you mentioned, like what does that go toward? Because when I think of like the scale of the pollution out there, that doesn't seem like $1.4 million doesn't seem like enough to like clean it up or fix it. So what does that $1.4 million go toward? I think that the $1.4 million, there was, um, there's about $1.2 million that is for future restoration projects. Um, and so that can be things, um, anything that, that benefits the water quality, water availability. So that can be like phreatophyte removal. It can be um, cutting off uh, current sources of pollution that continue to degrade the water quality. Um, there's about $120,000 for cultural losses. And so um, I think we will defer to the to Zuni tribe and the Navajo Nation to determine how they want that, that money to be used. Um, and then there is part of that settlement is past ONRT costs, um, or actually past trustee costs. So all of our co-trustees have incurred costs, and then the, the future costs of putting together a restoration plan. We had talked a couple of years ago, the Pentagon had added Fort Wingate to its list of possible locations where PFAS or mm -hmm. perm polyfluoroalkyl substances had been released. Did the Pentagon ever complete that study? Do we know if there's PFAS out there as part of the contamination? Not to my knowledge. So the settlement agreement that we have now really covers known sources of contamination or known contamination. So PFAS, at, you know, at, at last, to my knowledge, that determination of PFAS has not been made yet. I don't know where they are in that process. Um, but um, we do, we will always have the um, opportunity to go back and um, pursue that should PFAS be found at Fort Wingate. Okay, that's good to know because I was reading in the settlement that was filed in federal court, it says that parties can't sue over certain things, but mm -hmm. so if there, if there were additional problems, the state can kind of... Right, this consent decree really covers known, the contaminants that were known, uh, that are known as of right now. Okay. Um, and like you mentioned, there is a public comment period until May yes. 2nd. We'll put that on our website as Great. well. Your office negotiated another settlement recently. Let's talk about Gold King Mine. Um, so most, uh, I think New Mexicans are familiar with the Gold King Mine release. So it was a, um, a release of many millions of gallons of um, uh, toxic uh, contaminants that were released outside of Silverton, then flowed down into the Animas River into New in New Mexico and into the San Juan, turned the rivers kind of a, a bright yellow color. Um, so the state of New Mexico, and so that it, so the Attorney General, the New Mexico Attorney General, the and the Environment Department brought a, a lawsuit against um, both the mining defendants, um, their contractors, and the um, sorry, the mining defendants, the EPA, and their contractors. And so um, in January of 2021, um, those parties, and including ONRT, reached a settlement with the mining defendants um, that, that brought $11 million to the state of New Mexico. $1 million of that was for natural resource damages. So that came to ONRT. And just um, Two weeks ago, we so we went through a whole public input process. We reached out to the community in the Four Corners area. How do you think that million dollars should be used? What are the projects that you feel would compensate for the injury to natural resources? And um, 
We received four proposals. We have enough funding to fund them all, so we're very excited. Those um, we are, um, we have went through again public comment once we had uh, selected the projects, and um, are now in the process of developing the MOAs with um, the project proponents to get those projects underway. So um, that's very exciting. And what are some of those projects? Like, what, what do they involve? So we'll partner with San Juan County um, government on a boat ramp that will um, really help compensate for the loss of uh, um, access to the river for um, the outdoor recreation industry. We will be partnering with the Hogback um, Chapter House uh, to help improve their irrigation system. Mm -hmm. um, a partnership with uh, Farmington, the city of Farmington, on a, a pavilion that will um, provide better um, better conditions for their farmers market. Again, looking at how, you know, the, the farmers, the agriculture industry was really um, damaged by th that release, both in terms of, you know, what happened to their, their fields, but also the stigma that is, continues to be associated with agricultural products from that area. Um, and the fourth one, we're partnering with the San Juan Soil and Water Conservation District on a soil health project that will both improve water quality and provide a real benefit for farmers um, who are participating to lower their costs and improve their soil conditions. So um, all four of those projects are um, really exciting and um, I think we're just really eager to get started. Well, thanks Maggie hart Evans, well, for joining me and for watching out for New Mexico's natural resources. Well, thank you and thanks to you. Let's welcome our line opinion panelists one final time to talk about oil and gas leasing on public lands opening back up. Leasing public lands for extraction had been put on hold by the Biden administration, but after 13 states filed an injunction to end that moratorium, a judge sided with those states. New Mexico is not part of the complaint, but more than 520 acres in our state are set to be auctioned off. President Biden also directed the Department of the Interior to review the federal oil and gas program. We'll get to that in a moment. But first, with a wide brush, with only 13 states requesting a change, Senator Feldman, is the federal government letting states like New Mexico down here? Well, um, I think so. I think that the, the pressure to do so was, was tremendous, however. Right. Yeah. And so uh, the... Um, and the court settlement said that uh, you had to open up uh, leasing again. Um, and we, of course, are lucky because we have the caveat that the oil and gas leasing uh, cannot be done within a 10 mile uh, buffer zone surrounding Chaco Canyon. Mm -hmm. But uh, oil, and la oil and gas leasing is resuming, uh, most notably in Southeast New Mexico. Mm -hmm. And uh, that doesn't mean that drilling will begin, though. I think that they will, the lands will just be locked up uh, so that drilling can happen when the market favors it. And of course, the market is beginning to favor it. Uh, but in the meantime, any conservation efforts, any plans for the, that area will be stymied by the fact that uh, this, this won't ha won't happen now because the the land is kind of locked up mm -hmm. uh, for that purpose. So in that sense, yeah, I, you know, I I'm disappointed uh, that it's resuming, but I certainly understand the pressure uh, to do so. Sure. Just a quick note on where uh, Senator Feldman was talking. Uh, one of the sites in Chavez County between Artesia and Roswell, in four sites in Lee County. Um, further east of the Texas border, and 10-year leases will be issued uh, to the bidder. Uh, now, Ed, some of the specifics uh, in that review from the Interior Department, it says the program, quote, fails to provide a fair return to taxpayers, inadequately, inadequately an accounts for environmental harms, fosters speculation by oil and gas companies, as we just heard, and leaves communities out of important conversations, end quote. End quote. Despite all that, leasing is back on. At what point should all of this be taken into consideration? Well, the, you know, the moderate view is, and, and I do understand that both both sides of this argument on the on the fringes, mm -hmm. is the environmentalists are very very concerned about the environmental damage, uh, the emissions, the our carbon our carbon footprint, and the oil industry is very much concerned about the regulatory issues associated with with drilling, which has caused some of them to stop drilling. 
Of course, current economic conditions, the need for greater oil production has created this need for more drilling. And so both, I guess both sides, the issues on both sides need to be need to be looked at, but it seems like the middle ground mm -hmm. is let's continue to allow these these leases to take place and the and the option to drill. Uh, but let's take into consideration the needs and the concerns of the environmentalists who have been um, fighting for a reduction of, of, of these greenhouse gases and emissions uh, caused by, by oil, oil use and, and, mm -hmm. and drilling. And so, yeah, I think they have a valid point that with these, uh, with these leases, uh, locking up these lands, that those issues of concern are, are addressed. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we're just uh, taking a step back. That's right. Senator Feldman, we got to bring it up. It's our own Secretary of the Interior, New Mexico's own uh, Deb Holland, of course. Uh, she's speaking up on this too, saying the federal government has overlooked the priorities of tribal communities, who, as Ed mentioned, who see the most consequences from pollution. And Ms. Holland has said she's ready to start those conversations about those consequences of drilling. Is she right? Yes, mm -hmm. she is right. And I think there are public hearings that are going to be held uh, around the state mm -hmm. uh, on the conditions under which the leasing will occur. And uh, this report has got a lot of good things in it that will address some of the community concerns mm -hmm. and will also address a very antiquated system in which royalties in New Mexico lagged far behind uh, Texas and other states. So in this resumption of drilling and leasing rather, um, there will be an increase in the royalties paid uh, from 12.5% to 18.75%, uh, which brings us up to other states. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think people need to weigh in. They need to read that report um, if they can and testify. I know there's one uh, hearing in Farmington, uh, and I assume that there are others around the state mm -hmm. uh, because these are community impacts, um, uh, methane emissions, um, uh, disruption of uh, uh, land, the landscape, essentially, with roads mm -hmm. and um, all kinds uh, and water depletion mm -hmm. uh, that happen uh, around these drilling sites. You know, interesting, uh, <laughs> kind of chuckling, we mentioned the royalty rates. That rate was set in 1920. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's like, how do we get this far to this point? We're just kind of getting to this. Um, Senator uh, <laughs> Snyder, the Department of <laughs> Interior, going to stay with uh, that for a second, uh, going back to the Chaco Canyon point made by Senator Feldman a second ago, uh, they're going to start taking comments about the situation, the proposed withdrawal from Chaco Canyon, protecting some 350,000 350, acres of federal land from future oil and gas leasing for a period of 20 years. I'm interested in the shape of that conversation. It's a, a cherished part of our New Mexico thing. And I know a lot of people are just flat out disgusted. It's even under discussion at all, <laughs> that it just should be just completely off the table. Should Chaco be completely off the table from oil and gas exploration? Personally, yeah. I think that we should give serious, serious thought to that. Okay. Uh, because it's just like I, I'm very into looking at uh, old homes and, and particularly those that were built in during Revolutionary War times and, mm -hmm. and before the Civil War. How many are still left? How many have been destroyed? And once you destroy it, you don't get it back. Right. So I think when you're talking about a treasure, and to me, this is not just a New Mexico treasure, this is a natural, national treasure. Uh, fact is international. Yeah, However, is. I grew up in an oil and gas family. Mm -hmm. So I tend to lean toward them and, and have such respect for them. Mm -hmm. The thing that for me that comes to this, and there hasn't been any mention of it that I've seen, is the bigger picture. Look at what Russia is doing uh, to other countries, yes. cutting off their supply. We're in the United States is buying oil from Saudi Arabia, and yet we're stopping the drilling and the purchasing of oil and gas here in our own country. Uh, fact oh, are, is, we a net, are we a net positive exporter of uh, oil at this not, point? No, we're not. We were. Okay. And if the biggest and the thing that it leads into is that is also 
holding some countries back a little, increasing their cautiousness because they get their oil and gas, their energy from Russia. Mm -hmm. Germany gets and Angela Merkel signed, and I remember this discussion, it was a national discussion between her and President Trump, is that they bought all their, their energy from Russia. When your people are, are depending on that, that does color your thinking about taking on the big guy. Uh, the second thing is, is we do we produce L, um, LTG, LGN, LG, mm -hmm. LNG, which is liquid natural gas. Right. And that can be shipped in a, it, we don't have to have a, an underground pipeline. We can ship it in tankers mm -hmm. to, the, to Europe. The United States could be supplying oil and gas and, and energy to most of Europe at this mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. So it's not just here in New Mexico. I mean, you look at Louisiana, eastern, western Louisiana has so much oil and gas coming out of there. So we're t when we change what our state's doing or what the federal level is doing, we're impacting the world. That's a good point. Not here. just New Mexico. I have to say thanks again to our line panel. As always, great subjects, great discussion this week. Now, be sure to let us know what you think about any of the topics covered on our Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram pages. I want to thank my colleague, our land host, Laura Paskus, for the tremendous work she's done over the past two years covering every possible angle related to wildfires in New Mexico. It all came together last Friday night with the longest season and our land wildfire special. If you didn't catch it, you can see it in its entirety on our YouTube channel or tune in next Thursday, May 5th at 7 p.m. for a rebroadcast. As you heard in the show, we are already talking about fireworks here in late April, meaning the last two weeks may have been just a prelude. Now, what worries me when I hear the word fireworks is our bosque. You might recall years ago the fire in the bosque that burned close to the intersection of Montano and Coors. And if you know where to look, the remnants of burned trees are not 50 feet south off the road. They are a reminder that danger in the bosque lurks. Now, can we get in front of that danger? That's going to be the question. And it goes without saying, we need an answer. Thanks again for joining us and for staying informed and engaged. We'll see you again next week in Focus. Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by viewers like you.